and welcome to a new season of Mythmakers. Mythmakers is the podcast for fantasy fans and fantasy creatives brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. My name is Julia Golding. I'm an author and screenwriter, but also I run the centre with its creative writing classes and all sorts of other things we get up to. And today I'm joined by my frequent podcast partner, Jacob Renica who is over the other side of the pond. I think you sit in, is it Seattle? If I... Seattle, correct. Yeah. Uh, and Jacob, as if you've listened before, you'll know that Jacob is not only very expert on Tolkien, but he also um, works for Ravensburger, who creates some of those wonderful games, which no doubt you've seen and maybe even been given this back in last Christmas. Um, so Jacob, welcome. Now, since we last spoke, uh, I've been away in New Zealand on a fantastic, uh, quite a long trip around both North and South Island. So for the very first podcast uh, episode, I thought it would be quite good to think about New Zealand specifically and Peter Jackson and what's been happening there since, well, basically the turn of the millennium and its relationship with Tolkien, because I found the whole experience of being there, absolutely fascinating, really, really fascinating. So have you got any experience of New Zealand or is yours all through having watched the films? Mine's all through films, strictly films and special features <laughs> from Lord of the Rings extended edition. So I haven't, haven't yet. That's on my pilgrimage site, but I haven't quite made it there. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear uh, more about, about your experience there and uh, what you found both while you were there, how it's influenced, how you think the world views Middle Earth, uh, and what, while you were there, you saw this film series impacting New Zealand in general. So, yeah, I think that's probably the first place to start with it because it's very clear even now. So, when was the filming? The filming for the very first set of films was 1999 to 2000. 2001 it's that kind of era so we're talking almost 25 years ago now and what is fascinating is to see how through a series of quite um it's an episode of being it's a mix of being really determined to make this and some luck in getting funding in Hollywood and all sorts of little elements that came to into being that Peter Jackson went from being this kind of indie slightly offbeat filmmaker of these kind of horror pieces and offbeat you know indie films to being a major director so if you now go to Hollywood Boulevard his star is pretty much outside the Oscar venue the Dolby Theatre so he's gone from obscurity to being central. And in the sort of slipstream of the Peter Jackson phenomenon, he's built a whole Hollywood in New Zealand. In fact, I think there's a sign in Wellington where he's based called Wellywood or something. You know, they 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 know this. So it's not just that he's built a sort of film studio there in an old paint factory in other places, right on top of the airport there. He's also a major investor in Weta Workshop. And Weta Workshop itself is now one of the two leading uh, special effects places. There's them and Industrial Light and Magic, which is George Lucas. I mean, there are lots of other places around the world that do this, but these are two really big players. So they're working on Avatar. They've done King Kong. I mean, they've just done lots and lots and lots of, of films since. And it's it's big, it's impressive being digital. It doesn't matter where you are in a sense, as long as you've got enough computers and talented people. So the industry is built pretty much on Peter Jackson. And the other sort of New Zealander who people know as a director is uh, Taiko Watiti. Watiti, is that his, have I got yeah. that right? Um, but he doesn't have the same foothold there I don't see him putting back into uh you know he an industry yet maybe mm -hmm. he maybe he's got plans so it is very much 
hanging around Peter Jackson and everywhere we went, there was people talking about him owning land, um, his, his what, he, what he does in employment, some good, some bad. So it's fascinating to find a country so dominated by one name and that one name was made by a set of films from this obscure professor in Oxford. <laughs> you know, it's, it's quite a, a phenomenon, really. I read a very good book as well, um, which I bought at Hobbiton uh, by Ian Nathan called The Making of Middle Earth, which for all of you really keen keenies out there, I do recommend. Um, it's quite funny because I was reading this book and how it came to be funded by Bob Shea at New Line. Um, there's a bit of um, less desirable funders in the picture before. Um, yeah. Um, but it ends <laughs> up with New Line. And I then when I went on to do some meetings in Hollywood, L.A., I met um, Bob Shea's, I think he's his nephew, who I'm working on a project <laughs> with. So that was quite fun. You know, um, it's not such a big world, the film world, when it gets down to it. So, yeah, it was fascinating to see how dominant Peter Jackson is, even now, 25 years on. Um, so, yeah, if you were going to go to uh, New Zealand, have you got any sort of on your must-see list of things to go to? Having Yeah, that's hard. Speaking of. Yeah, having watched it. Yeah, that's a, so I know that with one of the reasons why uh, New Zealand made for such a great uh, filming location is the incredible diversity uh, of the landscape, right? So you can, within an hour and a half flight, you can get to, you know, Mount Snowy Mountains and, you know, the, the, you know forests, uh, kind of rolling hillsides, uh, sparse terrain. The only thing I don't have is a desert. Uh, so yeah. if, so that, yeah, so that, that, that any of those places, like, I would be tickled. <laughs> I mean, Hobbiton is 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 picturesque, um, and so that's that 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 of course would be fun for more of a if 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 on that particular travel day I was looking to relax a little bit more, uh, and slow my pace. I think that would be great. If I was in a frenetic mood, I would perhaps want to be a little more adventurous and go uh, hiking the path of Karadrath and. Yeah, that is quite like that hike. Yeah. No, I mean, the funny thing is that even though I sort of think I'm fairly, you know, I did geography at school and I sort of knew a map vaguely of New Zealand and I'd watched the making of, I hadn't really mm. grasped until I went there exactly how it all works. So if you're planning your trip, yeah, tell us. If you're planning your pilgrimage, the two islands, the South Island is sort of a, a rounder and fatter island uh it's further south so it's colder and that's where the dramatic alp type scenery is not that the north island doesn't have mountains but it's the the ones you're thinking of in the fly past but it's also very very sparsely populated so it's real wilderness you can go to places where there are no farms there's no uh, fences there's no sign of people for miles and miles and miles and miles it's quite a phenomenon so if the population is something like um, don't quote me on this but it's something like five million only a million of those live in the south island the hmm. north island which is kind of longer and thinner a bit like a diamond shape very roughly um with wellington down the bottom and auckland up the top has everybody else and a lot of those people are in either Auckland, which is the biggest city, and Wellington. So it, it reminded me a bit, actually, of Iceland. Iceland has a similar thing, except east to west, where um, a lot of people live around Reykjavik and the rest of the country is fairly empty. So it had that feel to it. And no wonder both places are used for fantasy films because they have so many places you can set up a camera and do a, you know, a 360 pan without seeing anything else. So if you're actually planning to do your Lord of the Rings tour, um, we did it an unconventional way. Most people start up in Auckland and make their way down to Queenstown. Uh, I actually did it the other way around. Why not? Um, so I would say my top five places to go would be in order of visiting them, this is. 
I would go to the lakes around Lake Tekapo, which is quite near Christchurch. So you're on the South Island. And Lake Tekapo and the lake next door to it, whose name escapes me just now, uh, are the lake are there. You see them um, in the, the Hobbit for Lake Town. Is that sort of amazing, really, really blue, wonderful lake. Um, very beautiful. Also a great place to stargaze. Then going down, I'd go to Queenstown, which is like number one. Queenstown is almost everything. It's <laughs> it's almost everything. It's um, the the remarkable mountains. There's a range called the Remarkables are used again and again. They're the barrier mountains for Mordor. They pop up loads of times. They're used for um, uh, part of the retreat where they, they go up into the hills uh, in Rohan and they get the sword. I'm just trying to remember what that place is near the Paths of the Dead. Um, and then, of course, up at the near Queenstown, if you go along the lake to a place called Glenorchy, this is a couple of hours drive, right up towards the foot of the mountains. There you see Caradras. There you see uh, Zirak Zigil, where, you know, Gandalf fought the Balrog. There you see Bjorn's house. I mean, it was it was multi-purpose. Um, bits of Lothlorien. It's absolutely beautiful. I've got it as my desktop saver because it's such a beautiful place. <laughs> you know, it's um, so I highly recommend Queenstown. I mean, there are other places around there. Deer, Deer Heights, Deer Park Heights, which is right on the edge of the town. I mean, you can see the town from there. That was used again and again for where the wargs attacked and where the um, people are um, escaping to... Um, Helm's Deep, wending their way through uh, landscape. There's some of those big shots all around there. So Queenstown, you're spoiled for choice. Oh, it's also got um, the Argonath. You know, I could go on. <laughs> um, so now, were you were you doing a kind of self guided tour around? Mainly, uh, but we did there, do okay. a Lord of the Rings safari that day, oh, and wow. run by people there who 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 actually do that, and they have a all of their Jeeps have like Arwen or Saruman as their um, number plates. And I would say that I totally loved the morning. This was New Year's Day. It was the best New Year's Day our family have ever had, where we went off and dressed up and ran at each other with swords, <laughs> family <laughs> bonding stuff, with a right. great guy called Justin, um who when he found out i knew about tolkien got really into us as a family and he just was milking me for information about tolkien my family gets like shut up mum i want to talk to you <laughs> um but he was really really good the afternoon was less fun because um we, we lost justin and we're it was it was i preferred the morning so if i was going to do a half day tour from queenstown i'd definitely go to glenorchy uh rather than to arrow town which is what we did in the afternoon um, anyway, so that's that's probably a bit too minutia for people, but you never know. You might be listening to this thinking, I've got half a day. Where should I go? That's where to go. Go up to paradise. It's literally called paradise. Um, so that's the second place I'd go. And then the other places are on the North Island. So Wellington is spot number three. Wellington has Weta Workshop where you can do a tour of the special effects studio. It's a small tour. It's not anything on the scale of a studio tour in LA or even the Harry Potter tour in London, but it's an interesting tour because it's like the working, you know, the where, they, where it all comes from. <laughs> uh, and just by there in Wellington, you can go up and see the places where they did some of the early filming in Victoria Park. So the very first shots of um, Lord of the Rings where they're leaving the Shire were filmed just in the backyard of Weta Workshop makes you realize just how parochial, how local everything was. And then I would, so that's number, we've got to number three, haven't we? Three, right. Yeah. Number four, I'd actually, so this is where it gets tricky because I know what number five is. There's quite a few places I'd love to go, but I think number four might be Rivendell, which is quite close to Wellington. But I just thought the, 
the combination of the river valley and the woods, which were sort of a beautiful, fresh green, were very atmospheric. It really felt a beautiful, I mean, you could see why they chose it for Rivendell, because of course Rivendell is that place we all want to go. Um, and I love that very much. And then the absolute top, joint top with Queenstown is Hobbiton. Uh, Hobbiton was so much better than I expected. I mean, just a hundred percent better. I had gone thinking it would be a ersatz kind of Disney experience. I kind of half feared they might have people walking around as hobbits or something, but no, it was really, really well done. Um, they, you meet outside the the village outside Hobbiton and they take you through in well-timed, you know, coach loads. So you never feel bunched up or crowded. I was there on a beautiful hot day and it looked amazing. They have a team of gardeners who keep it all running beautifully and they've developed it so that it's not just front doors in a hillside. Since December, they've opened up a, a Hobbit hole. So that was never a, Never a Peter Jackson location because the inside places are all built in studios. They've actually replicated their own version of a Hobbit hole. And it's huge. It's as big as my house on one floor. Uh, it's got a living room, a bedroom, a bathroom, a dining room, a kitchen, a study. I mean, it's just really, really wonderful. And you can touch everything. You can sit on the beds. You can look at the little props they've made because it is all props. It's nothing is mm -hmm. sort of valuable in a sort of, it's been in a movie sense, but it was wonderful. And then you finish at the green dragon, which brews its own beer and cider and non-alcoholic drinks. And that was really nice, really <laughs> decent beer. So um, that whole experience was Far better. I live in a village which is a bit like a kind of Hobbiton village. We have thatched houses and thatched walls, and I guess we're all a bit hobbity with our gardens. And I was going thinking I was going to be a bit kind of, oh, well, you know, I should have stayed at home. But actually, I thought, no, 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 this is really well done and um, highly recommended. So if there's just one thing that you do in New Zealand involving Lord of the Rings, do go to Hobbiton. It's well worth it really is. Excellent. Well, that sounds great. Um, I'm really interested to hear maybe what struck you being at some of those different locations that you knew so well from the film. What sort of additional insight, feeling, I don't know, perspective did you get when you were at, say, like, you talked about Lothlorien in particular and Hobbiton. So some of these places, what were there, were, were there meaningful, I don't want to say like differences or things that in your imagination are from where we saw it through the camera, what was different from that experience versus actually being there on the ground uh, that, that struck you? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what you think about the difference between the first trilogy and the second trilogy. So um, Lord of the Rings versus The Hobbit. In the, it, it really brought to mind how important it is to actually go into locations. So for example, in um, Rivendell, a lot of it, in the studio doesn't work as well for me as the bits when they're outside. And even with the best kind of lighting, you still get that sense of expansiveness and like a breath of fresh air mm. when it is actually in the real place and they're standing in a location. Um, so obviously there's no longer any of this, the sets have gone, you know, cause it's, it's a natural beauty spot, but you can sort of, put them back in in your mind and see how they pieced it together. And it made me think that one of my problems with The Hobbit, I mean, there was a several things with The Hobbit. One was the very overextended storytelling, which is probably its fatal right. flaw. But there was also the, the punched up colours because of the particular frame rate that was used, which also mm -hmm. made it feel a bit unreal. Right. Though having said that, colours in New Zealand do sometimes feel unreal because they're so... <laughs> I mean, I've I've printed them off and put them on the wall. And I thought, hang on, that looks like I put a filter on them. But no, they they do come out like that. Um, but also the use of a lot of computer generated mm -hmm. scenery and interiors and and characters running through like a sort of video game style. 
And it made me just think, oh, it's so much better doing it old style where somebody's actually in a muddy field um, or in a local park. Or I just thought that that approach the first time round, I know it was hard, hard for the actors, unreliable weather. You can see why people take these choices, but it did make it feel so much more authentic to the book because the book is all about moving through a landscape and the difficulties of walking, the sore feet, the the roots poking you in the back, you know, all those things which make it feel a very grounded fantasy. So, yeah, going going there made me think, oh, yeah, they got it right the first time round, didn't they? I think that was my feeling. That's great. Yeah, the, the difference between filming on location and filming in front of a green screen you're right. There's there's a lot of different factors that come into play, and certainly with fantasy uh, films in particular, uh, is oftentimes dependent upon spectacle, computer generated images. So it's it's more convenient sometimes, but certainly there's a, there's a different feel. And I know that since uh, you know Peter Jackson filmed Lord of the Rings there, that that more films have filmed in. New Zealand, um, ones that would be perhaps relevant to this audience. Uh, the first two Chronicles of Narnia films were filmed in New Zealand, um, as, were, as were the first two Avatar uh, films. So when they did, although Avatar does heavily, heavily use yeah. CGI, uh, Chronicles of Narnia, not so much, right? Uh, but in utilizing that landscape for a kind of a more fantastic heightened sense of reality there's something yes yes you can create that digitally but uh you're right there just seems to be kind of a different feel just as it seems to be a different feel when you have uh practical puppets that you're working with that you're mm -hmm. acting alongside and not just somebody holding a tennis ball which is where you know the andy circus and in that book that you mentioned talks about you know what his process uh and how transformative that was for the actors to actually have him there in the scene and not just have sit, not just tell the actors look look in this general direction this person's going to be talking to you but actually having the person there to interact with uh that that is yeah. uh tremendously helpful as you know as a person as a human being who's conditioned to respond to physical environment and stimuli like that you just, you can't help but lose something when you're filming and just having to just imagine it versus feeling, like you said, kind of like feeling the sun, feeling the wind, uh, and being there with your feet on firm ground and actual trees and rocks and uh, mountains around you. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to take it away from the very clever people who build sets and uh, the people who do the digital effects. I mean, they do an amazing job. And I imagine there are quite a few things I don't notice, which I think are real and actually were never there because they've got so good. But I think in terms of performance, that feeling of water being wet and sun being hot and cold, you know, it just it just feels, it brings something else out, I think, in performance. Um, anyway, so yeah. I think one of the other things which I, I wanted to ask you about is, do you think actually the such a strong association between New Zealand and Middle Earth is a good thing for readers of Tolkien because in a way it skewed our whereas before we all had our own private little imaginations <laughs> about what Middle Earth was like unless you've I think it's almost impossible to avoid any imagery from the films now but right. almost all of us now are seeing it through a New Zealand lens do you think mm -hmm. that's a bad thing or a good thing well, it is interesting uh, question because I know with uh, Rings of Power, you know, they started filming in New Zealand, right? Beca because of that, because of that, you know, kind of culturally embedded tie between Lord of the Rings, Tolkien and New Zealand. But then they moved filming to the UK and that there was an uproar among certain, you know, loud segments of... <laughs> Uh, Lord of the Rings fans on how could you possibly move it from New Zealand it is the one true and living uh, embodiment of Middle Earth so I think there's certainly people who would would want that um, it's it, like you said it's impossible to get around that imagery if you're coming to Tolkien through uh, the films first uh, then of course that's going to color how you imagine 
the words themselves of the book, uh, but even vice versa, you know, when you're reading, having read, uh, you know, the books first, it's still hard to sometimes disentangle your purely, you know, self-generated imagery, which is, which is much like what AI is doing, right? When you're reading a book and you're putting images in your mind, you're just scraping all of your previous memories from films, from places you've been, and you're kind of doing, creating some sort of imaginary composite in, in your own mind for what this book would look like um, in your mind's eye. So it, it's hard if you're going back and revisiting that, it's hard to keep that original pristine self uh, amalgamated image of what this looked like with what you've seen on the big screen because it's so visually power, you know, powerful and arresting, especially if you saw it on the big screen because it's even more <laughs> probably imprinted on your uh, retinas uh, and imagination because of the scope and scale that you saw it at. So it's hard to disentangle those. So I think it's, yeah, it's inevitable that there, that there will be a connection there at the scope and the audience, right? The the just the sheer number of people that saw those films versus Rings of Power, of which there's a significantly fewer audience base. And so in them moving their filming to the UK, it's uh, I, I don't know that it'll have as big of a cultural impact in how we view Middle Earth. And especially, you know, there's there's clearly a lot of um, you know heavy reliance on CGI, especially um, when you're looking at different cities, um, mm -hmm. uh, Numenor in particular, right? So, you know, the striking visuals that are entirely CGI because unfortunately we don't have large <laughs> scale settings. We don't have basically Atlantis to... anywhere. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So, yeah, so it's a good question. So is it is, is that a good thing that excuse our imagination I, uh, or our knowledge of Tolkien, how we view it? I, I imagine, you know, as we're reading the books, it's a personal individualized experience. Um, even if you've seen the films, it's it's hard not to, or even Rings of Power, it's hard not to use those images to fill your own imagination, um, which is useful. I think any any more grist for the mill uh, of your imagination is is a good thing. Um, and then it's just, I guess, yeah, uh, it's, it's inevitable, I suppose it's inevitable <laughs> uh, at, at this point, just because of the culturally how far those images kind of see. So I'd be interested to see how, if, uh, as, as they're producing additional Lord of the Rings films, how much the imagery that they use there and their filming locations play into the larger kind of cultural imagination of Tolkien, which has evolved over the past, you know, 40 uh, plus years. So I'd be, I'm very interested to see how it continues to evolve with additional films um, including animated uh, yeah. Tolkien films. Well, that's true. I mean, of course, the, we should also put in uh, this space the uh, huge influence that John Howe and uh, Alan um, Lee had on the... Alan Lee? Is that the right? Yes. Yeah, just, just having a, a moment, I think. Is that the right name? Um, had on the way it was then interpreted. Mm -hmm. um, so it's come... It's as though they drew it then... New Zealand found it on in the in the and uh, you know it's it's that kind of co combination. So it did start off as a, a painterly approach, and of course anybody who's bought um, Tolkien books or calendars over the years will know there are other artists available who do a different version of. So there are other ways of imagining Middle Earth um, that can be sort of laid upon our imaginations as well. It's hard to get away from it, though. I find it easier to kick to the curb character faces of some of the characters because um, the Hobbits weren't cast as they are in the book. You know, Frodo's too young, um, Sam's too American, frankly. Um, <laughs> you know, his sensibility isn't quite... You know, I can quite easily make him into something else in my head because I already had quite a firm view harder with Gollum um hmm. because Gollum seemed a more spot-on performance though I am quite fond of the BBC audio drama version as well um yeah so but the landscapes are tricky and I'd actually really welcome in my lifetime <laughs> it sounds a bit dramatic uh, but I would welcome a different place to stand in for Middle Earth just so that we can break the hmm. I don't, I mean, it would be really nice to see somebody else interpret 
the books in a new way finding yeah. just so that we can sort of have more than one version of this in our head Agreed. a bit like Agreed. you don't want just one hamlet performance or one midsummer <laughs> right. night's dream it's fun to see it set one place and then another place and um, one of the things that i have always obvious easy gains for me would be to actually take seriously that these are places where people live so um Edoras, though it's an amazing location it doesn't seem to be it's very very isolated and there's not much sense of a lived landscape around it and it's that's even so true of um Minas Tirith which we know from the book has a uh, a wall around it and farms. It's much more like the Battle of Waterloo happening on a an existing series of farms. So you could actually go more historic mm. and actually have traces of people in the landscape more rather than these vast plains, which I know are easier to am animate. Um, <laughs> they haven't got pesky things in the way, um, but that's not how it's described in the books. Uh, and also, I think the other thing I would do, which is taken from living in a landscape which has lots and lots of layers of history in it when they do put history in the landscape there it's very much oh here's a bit of architecture that's been left behind but mm. actually in the book you're, you're dealing with old roads and mm. you get the old forts but you've got the barrows and um i live near some old roman roads which are sort of hidden under the grass but there is a, a discernible road there so you could quite easily um Think again. I think it's the, doing the more historic version, as opposed to the fantasy version. That'd be fun to see. I mean, for me, that would be a fresh take, more uh, believable, and it perhaps could help give me another version to think about. You know, just set it up yeah. in Scotland or I, you know, the Isle of Skye. Got some nice pointy mountains up there. Um, <laughs> I think Tolkien himself were, was partly inspired by a visit to the Alps. So you mm -hmm. could actually have some of the Alpine um, mountains as your, you know, your amazing landscapes. That's not so very far away. What about in America? The, You've got lots yeah, of that could be set. Yeah, yeah, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big country. Um, I think one of the landscapes that has the greatest diversity. Um, Utah is great for like you know incredibly high mountains arid deserts um forest spaces so there's there's a reason why a lot of uh films are uh set there um uh yeah and it, and again it depends on the type of film but, but for lord of the rings in particular kind of the more harsh dramatic um imagery does work well so there um forests and whatnot uh you know, if you're in the eastern United States, uh, uh, Atlanta, so Georgia is another popular filming location for a lot of uh, shows where there's uh, emphasis on woods. Um, that's good. Uh, and just north of the United States, just north of Seattle, uh, Vancouver is another uh, popular oh, uh, filming Canada. location. Yeah. Yes, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's, again, because like the woods, uh, the scenery, um, a little less populated, so it's easier to film there. So all of those, you know, uh, locations have places where you can film without running into lo loads of people and having to remove them mm -hmm. digitally. Uh, but it does seem in, in thinking about, yeah, adaptations that uh, for Hollywood films, right. For big, big budget films that the more dramatic the landscape, the better, right. The more arresting the visuals, whereas where you're looking at the kind of like, long form uh television or limited series uh you don't need to have as much dramatic uh dramatic environment because there's more emphasis on individual characters and you can spread out over more characters so it seems like if you're looking at you know the farmland that's surrounding um menace Tirith, that it'd be easier in a if you're to do kind of like a limited series or turn you know lord of the rings into a, a television into a series instead of films that you could spend more time on the ground and looking at some of those, you know, slower, slower scenes, um, uh, landscapes that aren't as visually jarring, arresting, or particularly memorable, but there is something tonally that happens when you slow down and can focus on character interactions in a different setting like that. So yeah, so I think, I think it would be fun. I agree with you. There'd be fun to see someone else do a different take on 
uh, Lord of the Rings on where it is placed visually. Uh, there are certain elements in the in the book itself that certainly deserve to be highlighted there that could help shape how we view the story and what the characters are experiencing. That's a very good rationale, actually, because in a way, I feel the film's uh, such a good version that it's very hard to go into competition with them. Whereas the rationale of having a long long form TV series where you're not needing to do your sort of huge David Lean's you know, sweeping landscapes. Yeah. Um, you would put them in, but you don't need to have them every three minutes or whatever. The exactly. The hit rate yeah. is, and I don't know. It's probably a bit more than that, 10 minutes. Um, okay, well, that's uh, it's very helpful. Thanks. Uh, that's a really good idea. And we are both available <laughs> to, yeah, to organise the, the locations for the next version of this. Between us, I'm sure we can come up with a good list. Right. So um, we're going to finish on our top fantasy tip. Um, so, Jacob, where would you say is in your backyard? And I'm allowing you the whole of the United States as your backyard. Oh, wow. That's as quite in, generous. Where's the place you've gone and thought, wow, this feels so much like something I've read in Tolkien? Um, yeah, I think it would it, it would actually be, uh, again, so in, in the United States, and it's actually in the, in the Pacific Northwest of Seattle area, the uh, Olympic Peninsula is an uh, actual um uh, natural rainforest in North America. Um, so just, you know, giant, uh, giant trees, uh, you know, this just this really ancient feel uh, to it. So, you know, so par parts of it, Fanghorn Forest, um, even parts Lothlorien-esque, but just in terms of kind of like the natural green, just kind of, you know, this like the hum of a uh, living natural world. Um, uh, is certainly present there and close runner up uh, the redwood uh, forests in uh, California uh, yeah. where they have, you know, those redwoods are massive. So those in terms of spectacle and scale, just massive ancient uh, trees, different feel. It's more spread out, more airy in the, um, in the redwoods and more dense in say like the, the rainforest uh, in the Northwest. So those are the ones, yeah, that I think, for me, uh, definitely would have, have evoked that sense of uh, of kind of a Middle Earth uh, sen sensibilities, the spirit of, of Middle Earth. How about for you? Yeah, so I've given my um, New Zealand tips, but actually in my own backyard, uh, and literally in my backyard where I walk my dog <laughs> every day, is the downs. That's what's missing in um, New Zealand, because the downs are a huge part of uh the fellowship of the ring so you've got fog on the downs the barrow right whites and so on and even actually rohan is quite like the downs and it was the kind of backyard for where where you go if you were talking living in oxford you can drive out to see the downs and what the downs are are rolling green hills um and on top of the hill is an ancient track called the ridgeway which was an old droving road and there are lots of like roman forts and well an old temple in fact and burial mounds and things still left in the landscape and even though we're in a densely populated part of the world you can still find views where you don't see hardly anything in fact um just at the back of my village where i live now um they filmed the battle scenes in for napoleon the film the recent film because you could do this point a camera and run horses across the the fields without there being anything in the shot um and we you know i'm only a, not that far from london so it's one of those little pockets of landscapes so i i'd suggest going to the downs not spectacular but very tolkien-esque very atmospheric right well thank you very much jacob and thank you for talking to me about peter jackson and middle earth and many other location scouting between us as well Thank you. This is great. Thanks. We can't keep short, can we? <laughs> no, it's hard. Oh. Uh, Oscars, I think, is easy. Is, is a little bit. I think this one will be a little bit easier. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, Kara, uh, I, I think who uh, edits this, you must take this bit out, Kara. Don't put it out there because I'm now. We're now going to do episode two, where we're going to tackle the Oscars and fantasy. Um. So, beep. Off we go again. Have a sip of my tea first, though.
Hello and welcome to Mythmakers. Mythmakers is the podcast for fantasy fans and fantasy creatives brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. My name is Julia Golding. I'm an author and screenwriter and I also run the centre. And I'm joined today with my frequent podcast partner, Jacob Renica, who's based over in Seattle. Uh, he works in the game making industry, as in board games, uh, Ravensburger, but he is also an expert on all things Tolkien. Uh, so, Jacob, we are in the Oscar season, and I was thinking about the relationship between awards and fantasy films, because it's often said that fantasy is one of those genres which is not rewarded by those who hand out the Oscars. Do you think this bears out when you actually look at the list of films that have been winners? Do you think that's that thesis is correct? Yeah, I, I, I think so. And it's the the purpose of yeah, the, the question is who who's doing the voting? What's their expectations for when watching a film? Um, and those are very specific. And it, certainly the slant is toward films that are more uh, serious, uh, that are tackling big questions, and especially that have um, you know actors that are tortured in some way, uh, some variety of ways, right? Those are the ones that they're looking for, like the type of performances that they get. Um, so yeah, so I think it, it, it bears out in, in some senses and the closer that fantasy and fantasy adjacent films get to touching on serious uh, and meaningful subject matter and actors who have some sort of sense of <laughs> torturedness in their uh, in their role uh, that's where we get uh, some of the you know fantasy films directing acting happening um, but it, visually is different right the directing and visuals that's kind of like a separate one but we're talking about like major films like best picture yeah um, I, best I, actors I think, yeah i think we should restrict ourselves to talking about the acting awards and the best picture awards because yeah, when you actually dig down obviously uh, we don't even need to talk about special effects because very, very often it's they they sweep the balls yeah, films. yeah yeah uh, and also i was checking through the animated feature films uh, mm -hmm. i mean of course, most cartoons are fan just because you can draw right. cool things. But actually, purely fantasy, things like Spirited Away, wonderful films have won uh, the Oscar for Best Animated Feature. And just, just go and check. There's what's a wonderful Disney product. You know, just really good films. Yeah. Um, so let's put those to one side. What is lacking in the Best Picture winners? And I was thinking this because I went and had a look in the foyer of the Dolby Theatre back in January, and they've list the best picture for each year. There is no um, no smash hit there for mm -hmm. the fantasy. There's no Marvel film, for example. Um, right. And there is a strange choice of those which I would say fall slightly uneasily under fantasy films, um, with one exception. So The Shape of Water, if you remember that rather odd film? Yes. That is obviously a fantasy of sorts, but it's very offbeat, mm -hmm. very weird. Um, right. Birdman, that's a mixture of fantasy imagination and a sort of, mm -hmm. though you could say it's within the world of the actor um, who's in Right. Mind. So it's, I, that's why I'm saying it doesn't fit quite. Um, mm -hmm. Last year's winner, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, is a kind of sci fi high concept. Uh, right. But yeah, I suppose you could say that's fantasy. A as border well. on fantasy, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So maybe, fiction. maybe when then they do uh, have that element in them, it doesn't stop them winning. Mm. But they, with the only absolute mainstream total, yes, that's a fantasy film is obviously Return of the King, right. which won the Oscar in two thousand and four, I think it was. Um, and yeah, well, everybody agrees that's a fantasy film. Whereas the others you right. might describe more as a hybrid of other sorts of genres. But yeah, let's flip over it, to the performances and there you really do come up against a problem of them not rewarding performances in a, in a fantasy film. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah, and that's, that's to be expected. And, and with these, I think you're right on with the, 
like blending of genres makes it more palatable. But that if it's a heavily if it's a genre piece that's heavy fantasy or sci-fi or even to be fair, like you said, you know, like uh, an action film, uh, if it's kind of a big budget blockbuster action film, comedies, um, westerns even. Uh, well, what westerns more so because I think they can get to more of that serious slash, you know, meaningful and tortured performances. Um, but a lot of those kind of like big budget mass audience films, those aren't the ones that are being considered here or rewarded. So for the actors, it's the same thing. So that's it's, it's really interesting with the actors um, uh, in this most recent uh, Oscar uh, round uh, coming up that Barbie, which is a fantasy fantasy film, mm. uh, is has uh, you know nominations for best picture uh, and and two supporting actors and adapted screenplay, but not for best director or best actor. So Margot Robbie does not even get a nomination, even though the film is nominated and the supporting actors. Uh, it's really fascinating looking at those the supporting actors, right, Ryan Gosling and America Ferreira, as kind of like more tortured. It, yes, it is Barbie's story, but if you look at what Torture, the characters film, yeah. themselves are, are 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 having to wrestle with more intensively, and the this the what they're in in that degree of supporting actor, not in the primary actor. It's it's really interesting on how yes, yeah, so how how Margot Robbie and the main character for the film would not be nominated, but it's the same film and the same storyline, but that the two supporting actors for that, um, from that fantasy film are nominated. So it, it, there's a, a really interesting, I think that that's a good demonstration of, of what it is, because like Margot Robbie's character is Barbie most of the way through, right? It's kind of, a, her performance is yeah. fairly even and level, whereas the other two are characters that are kind of like yanked from their world and you see them wrestling at least in, in how they're it's more intensively and because it has i think perhaps less screen time on them you can see the wrestle a little bit more it's kind they of more a, intense than over the entire film but they have a better song <laughs> yeah, right <laughs> exactly exactly the song doesn't that doesn't hurt but yeah so the so with the the individuals um and performances yeah so we have like with lord of the rings in particular with as many Academy Awards as it did receive, including you know Best Picture, Best Director, Best Screenplay for you know, Return of the King, the only actor nomination uh, or reward award that you got was for Ian McKellen, just from Fellowship of the Ring, mm. um, was the only one that was won there. So, and it's interesting looking at yeah the different characters there, and there's yeah it's it's so, hard to say, sorry, but that's did, just an interesting Ian, trend. So, did Ian McKellen? Sorry, did he win something for it? Or was I he just believe. nominated? I don't. Uh, I thought he was. I didn't think any of them got an acting award. He didn't. He didn't get an award, but he was. It was a nomination. So oh, Elvin, okay. he was the only one that was nominated. Uh, oh, didn't okay. win, but that was even the only nomination across all three films was just Ian McKellen for the for Fellowship of the Ring. Oh, I, I, I'd forgotten that. Um, I'm just looking through the list of people uh, of men who won the acting role. I need to pull up the women because I'm having them back in my mind that maybe Michelle Yeoh won one for everything, everywhere, all at once. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, a woman winning, winning a main, if we right. allow that to be a fantasy. Of course, Joachim Phoenix won for being. Yeah, Joaquin Joker. Phoenix. And, and that's exactly and what you Heath say. It's the, it's the. Tortured. <laughs> it's yeah. got to be torture. Right. You torture your character. Right. And and, and the only, and I'd say like, even for like, the like big budget or an even, yeah, big budget Joker versus Dark Knight. So you have two, the only, I would say, you know, like the two best actor roles in a fa fantasy type or a fantasy adjacent film, you have Heath Ledger for the Joker and Joaquin Phoenix for, Phoenix for the Joker, both of which performances are these, again, like tor tortured individuals that are vacillating between two different worlds and so but but it's 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 really interesting that it's the same character that is winning both of those roles even though it's different franchises it's within the same story world of batman um that that's where you get these but batman is never nominated <laughs> for or is, is does never get this award for and i don't even think nominated for best actor um whereas the villain the more kind of emotionally complicated and <laughs> tor tortured hate to keep going back to that word but yeah, so that's that's kind of a anomaly in the uh, best actor 
uh, wins. Yeah, because I was thinking that um, Harry Potter was didn't didn't get in the running for any of these, and I was just thinking about the performances, particularly in the later films and in the very last one, which in a way is a war movie. Mm. And I do think that Daniel Radcliffe actually acts incredibly well. I mean, he's turned mm. out to be such a smashing actor. Um, you know, he's learned he learned in front of us all, didn't he? You know. Right. Um, and I think that when he actually goes at the end to offer up his life in a way is incredibly moving and is like some kind of war film sacrifice. But nobody ever said, oh, well, maybe Daniel, after having done seven, how many films was it? Seven or eight films? Uh, maybe he should be given a nomination at least. Nobody, I don't remember that being... Uh, no. Because he's a wizard, no. Harry. <laughs> right yeah yeah there's somehow you're in a different role yeah and it's oh, interesting snape. you know snape being the sort of yeah yeah um, see that one's one that i think would come probably closest to actually happening because of the everyone Torgan, loving alan the, rickman and thinking he just oh, alan rickman thing. right so yeah. if you look at and then i think to, to just emphasize this point even more looking at james cameron films right so james cameron recognized as you know one of the most influential filmmakers uh, of the past, you know, three decades, um, you have for Titanic. He does a show on, you know, a, a film about a historical event. Period piece wins eleven, you know, eleven Oscars uh, for Titanic, but and, and including two best and best and best actor um, for uh, in that film. Um, but for the his other films, right for the. You know, Alien, The Abyss, Terminator, Avatar, you only get one acting nomination. That's for Sigourney Weaver um, in there. But it's just, even though the, these films are recognized as being groundbreaking and important and significant visually um, and, and directed, uh, the actors in those films that receive such praise were not nominated, were not even nominated with the exception of Sigourney Weaver. Um, there, so you, you, there is definitely uh, a, is it a, I, I, I would say, I guess bias is an okay word to use, but it's just the the sensibilities on what they're looking for. I don't know if it's the visual, if they're then, if it's put, the film is put into this visual medium rather than the acting medium. But there are those that break through, and uh, cross over what we just mentioned with the. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix and Heath Ledger for Joker that even though those were but but but, but again both of those films weren't high fantasy uh, no, those were very no, no. grounded approaches yeah. to the superhero genre they're very very grounded with I don't even think with especially with with Joker that one being kind of devoid of any sort of you know technology and any sort of kind of superheroism it was just kind of more of a character study um, whereas the Heath Ledger was set within a clearly superhero genre, but it was a grounded Christopher Nolan's very grounded approach to uh, storytelling in the superhero genre, as opposed to Marvel films, which is a different beast entirely. Yeah, I, I mean, looking, I, I, it's, we obviously need to uh, look at other award. To I'm looking at the Oscars here, but looking at the. Um, acting nods that go very very often more often than not it's for somebody who's playing somebody from real life so you can tell how good they mm. are at being that person so Brendan Fraser was playing that guy the uh, you know the one with the the weight issue uh Will Smith the year before that was the tennis coach King Richard I think it is isn't it that one um Rami Malek um Bohemian Rhapsody Obviously, um, uh, Eddie Mercury, um, Gary Oldman, Darkest Hour, that's Winston Churchill, Eddie Redmayne, that's um, Stephen Hawking, I can go on, uh, Lincoln, Daniel Day-Lewis, Colin Firth playing the, the king, <laughs> and so on. So it does seem as though that's an easier... It's very hard to judge fantasy performances when you don't know what they're based on. Um, right. Maybe that's part of it that we can tell that our fellow actors have done a really good job because we know what they're trying to get at. Maybe it's just easier. You feel more secure in saying, 
oh, let's vote for Colin first, then let's vote for uh, a wizard, you know. Um, I don't know. Yeah. That might be part of it. But anyway, let's be different from the sort of general Oscar lineup. And let's think about which fantasy performances that have been neglected would we nominate? You can go back as far as you like, but who were the <laughs> ones who actually, when you think about it in the long view, which we now have, you think actually that really deserved a nod at the time and nobody noticed. Didn't get it. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think, go, again, going for the farthest back um, would be Seventh Seal, uh okay right <laughs> yeah right so in 1957 <laughs> right so yeah so so that's one so this incredibly film is you know this incredibly acted uh and it didn't get any at the time no oscar nominations whatsoever so that's one that's kind of people have returned to time and again for being uh you know, an incredibly influential uh piece of cinematography and you know storytelling and and acting so that's one going again way, way back. Um, I know we didn't have acting nominations uh, from uh, Wizard of Oz uh, with Judy Garland um, yeah. or anyone else supporting there, right? So that was one that you didn't have um, anything there. Um, I, I am I am happy that around the same time, you know, not too terribly long way, Mary Poppins, uh, Julie Andrews won Best Actress uh, for that. So we did have a female in a fantasy film oh. leading there uh in 64 but uh yeah yeah so those are so some of the older generation ones kind of coming up more recently in terms of the yeah, like film and acting uh oh i need to i need to sit one in before we get too modern yeah, yeah i think actually in retrospect um harrison ford in the very first star wars as a best supporting actor because yeah. he totally revolution you know the that he grounded that film. Right. Everybody else is playing, you know, heroic roles with great right. big stakes and being all very noble. And he's the there as the the hustler, the the guy who's right. which kind of made it feel real, uh, right. and fun, right. um, because you could understand his motives. He wasn't being powered until, of course, he pulled, comes through. You know, that's the, his his arc. His arc is very pleasing. So there's all sorts of things about that performance, which I think really set up the whole Star Wars thing right from the start. So I'd give him a Best Supporting Actor nod, if not the prize, because I don't know what else was around that year, but it'd be right. nice to see well, that and, recognized. And, and you do have uh, Alec Guinness as Ben Kenobi, as Obi-Wan oh, yes. Kenobi there, um, that, who actually gets a nomination for support Best Supporting Actor for Star Wars. Oh, uh, does he? Oh, oh right. excellent. Yeah. To get the nomination, right? So they do. So, and again, that part, so that that character, right? So, like Han Solo as being kind of like an archetypal character that brought so much to that role and, and pivotal in that role, I think being as successful and appealing to as many people as it did. But, but Obi Wan Kenobi, again, this character who's torn between trying to be, you know, a, a hermit, or, you know, a hermit, uh, removing himself from the larger stage of intergalactic interplanetary conflict, who then is forced to come out of that and then ultimately sacrifices his own life. Um, so that 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 range of performance and you know, the caliber of actor that he was. Um, and yeah, he had class, <laughs> didn't he? Yeah. yeah, right, right. So so he's doing, and he's approaching that film with those sensibilities and not seeing it mm -hmm. as necessarily like a genre piece, um, but that he's bringing the gravitas of a Shakespearean actor, which is what Ian McKellen did for Gandalf, uh, yeah. likewise, right? And Patrick his nomination. Stewart. And Patrick Stewart and Pat does that for the ones he's in as well. Exactly, exactly. So I think that's what, yeah. So so there, so I think, so I'm, I'm glad that justice was done to at least Obi-Wan Kenobi, but I would well, likewise would, would love to see. That. Thank you for, because I, I hadn't remembered that. So, okay, let's go a bit okay. more um, up to date. I mean, the world wasn't ready for it, but in retrospect, Gollum, Andy slash Andy Serkis should have got yeah. Best Supporting Actor, absolutely, um, absolutely. In Return of the King or Two Towers, I don't, I'm not, I'm not fast which one they pick. Probably Two Towers actually, because it's more more I screen would, yeah. time. Um, and wouldn't it have been fun to see Andy Circus go up with the like lead animator uh, and, <laughs> right. and, and accept the award in the voice of Gollum? I mean, that, it just should have happened. 
Right. Yeah. Or the tuxedo with little dots on it, uh, <laughs> motion capture dots on the tuxedo itself. Yeah. Um, no, that would, that, I think, yeah, ab absolutely. And that's one that I think now there's more openness to that actually being considered acting. And that's what, mm -hmm. if you read the, the, the book that we actually referenced in another episode on uh, New Zealand, there's a book that uh, the um, anything you can imagine, uh, Peter Jackson and the making of Middle Earth by uh, Ian Nathan uh, mm -hmm. talks about that and the, the complexities of dealing with an actor being seen from the academy and people evaluating, is this a cartoon? How are you evaluating this? Because it's not the person themselves on screen, but it's a motion capture of the person. So there's a whole kind of unexplored area between what is a performance and what's considered and eligible to be considered for mm -hmm. an award in a performance. So I absolutely agreed there. Um, I would highlight just a little bit before that, um, say Groundhog Day with Bill Murray, 1993. So this is a technically fantasy film, a time loop, one of the first like yeah, time loop fantastic films. Fantastic film, yeah. Right, and he is an actor beginning because it's a comedy, uh, kind of a situational, high concept situational comedy. The high concept might fly, but because it's a comedy that almost like removes the consideration because it's comedic, but but the the arc that he goes through in that film um as a character and the you know kind of like the philosophical turn that he makes uh is is fantastic um so i appreciate that but other ones i think one again like more more recently um uh a monster calls did you ever see that one so 2016 uh monster calls film adaptation of the book um it's Shivon uh, Proud and Patrick Ness collaboration because yeah, Shivon yeah. Proud died. Exactly. Yeah. So that one, that that one is, I, I I saw it in the theater and was actually able to see it kind of as an advanced screening of that one. And because I love the book so much, and it's one of the books that I give to people is Monster Calls uh, most frequently that I gift to other people uh, because the combination of the written word and the art uh, that's in there. Um, uh, with uh, Jim Kay, um, who does the art, who also does the art for the uh, illustrated uh, Harry Potter uh, editions oh, yeah. uh, that yeah. have come out. So, you know, Monster Call, so just like the powerful interplay between the the word um, and the art. But so what they did there, story-wise, incredibly moving story, um, but translating that into film, um, uh, Patrick Ness did the screenplay for that as well. And so it captures the same sensibilities and as an adaptation into a different medium, he adds something visually and character wise that you don't have in the books that really layered the performance uh, and the story itself and made it kind of a different creature. Um, but like the performances there, uh, Felicity Jones, an incredible performance as a you know young mother dying of cancer uh, and the, the um, her child, um, is I can't remember the name of the actor, but he just gave a stunning performance. And I, I don't know what the youngest actor that's been nominated <laughs> for uh, a, a, in one of these awards are, but we have had some you know, instances. Uh, oh, the one in the piano very was very young, wasn't she? Um, yes, 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 yes. But it's, it's, it's a rarity, but you have some, and especially now today, child actors are so good mm. uh, that, yeah, so that, that's one that I would like to see um, uh, Patrick or uh, Connor O'Malley, the character's name in Monster Calls, the the child. Um, he was phenomenal. And so see either Felicity Jones or uh, or him in a Monster Calls would be wonderful or, or even being considered for best picture, just visual. J.A. Uh, uh, Boyena, who did, who actually, so he was the director uh, who also directed the first two episodes of Rings of Power. Oh, okay. So that kind of like artistic sensibility that he brought to that um, cinematically is what's on on display there in A Monster Call. So, it, yeah. I did it, not it's, it's know incredible. that connection. So um, yeah. thank you. That, that has taught me something there. So um, I was wondering, going on your, it has to be a tortured performance. I did wonder about the film Logan, because it had Patrick Stewart mm. and um, yeah, and in it, plus also that young actress Daphne, she's got an unusual name. Uh, yes, Keen is that her name? Anyway, um, she's so the three of them all give very nuanced, proper acting 
<laughs> proper acting performances. And I don't, yeah, I think that was one that could have got the nod at some point. Yeah, yeah, with, with Hugh and Hugh, Hugh Jackman's performance in that is, and and even Patrick Stewart for supporting when he's yeah. uh, there in the film. Bo both of those, yeah, are, again, like that's another one of these superhero genre, but I, I would put that in the same class as uh, Joker, Joker. Yeah, like exactly. Joaquin Phoenix, right? That's really, that's that's very grounded um, and gritty and just more of a character study than an emphasis on the fantastical world that these characters are in. It really kind of yeah. zeroes in on the character um, and their internal world uh, and internal journey. So just to round this up, um, I'm going to allow you two picks for films that you think should have been fantasy films from previous eras that should have been in in receipt of the best picture for their year, looking at yeah. it in retrospect. Yeah. Um, uh, I wouldn't necessarily agree. If I, if I had to, yeah, for that, I would, I even think Green Knight most recently, a couple of years ago, was another one that was really good. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. The yeah. one with the, the Sagawain retelling. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so that one, the performance there, yeah. Um, Is it Dev Patel? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that was that was truly excellent. So if we're looking at, especially, I think, like, yeah, more recent films and performances, I would have, yeah, I would, as wild, <laughs> didn't happen and might never happen but i would yeah go with green green knight dead battalion green knight and uh the actor played connor o'malley in uh, monster calls yeah so i would go a little bit further back i was thinking of between et and close encounters mm. that both of those are actually quite artistic films when you actually look at them now maybe et because um it also had the popularity thing behind it but it said some some mm. very profound things and right. also the performances of the children again were wonderful in that. Yes, incredible. Uh, yes, I watched it yes, as yes. a child, so I I wasn't analysing it then. But looking at it now, it's it hasn't aged particularly badly at all. It's still got mm -hmm. a lot of um, legs to it. That one. Um, so yeah, that would have that would have pleased me if that had won a best picture. And I think more recently, well, I don't. I, they should give. Um, if going back to my Harry Potter point, it'd be quite nice if they gave a well done having made all those films award because they were very right. influential films. Mm -hmm. I don't know that all of them, each one was particularly perfect, but perhaps the one that should have won one was the third one. Yes. Um, the uh, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban because mm -hmm. it upped the game, the clever use of the time turner, the sensibility of it, the Gary Oldman. He doesn't think his performance that was great, but I think it was. Um, and it also the children, young people by that stage were getting into their stride as actors, right? So yeah. I actually thought that was a pretty good film and very well, and it. the director, yeah. When then that one in particular, it sounds like that's Alfonso uh, Cuaron, uh, who did who directed that one, uh, who has gone on to direct yeah. a number of other, like even, um, uh, yes, Oscar winning best pictures. So the filmmaker that they brought on, tonally, it's different, right. Yeah. Um, from uh, Chris, Chris Columbus, Columbus yeah. uh, right from um, from the earlier from the first two films it's very tonally very distinct and you know what he was getting there but Alfonso Cuaron brought a different sensibility to that mm -hmm. and so it is a little and granted like in the story it does kind of move a little bit darker because you're following the kids and it makes sense where you're starting out with having this director and this kind of tone and feel for the film because they're kids and they're entering into this wonderful world that's slowly becoming complicated but then now you're really fully moving into um, more significant plot complications as well as age-wise, these kids are aging up and teenagers, the sort of complicated uh, emotions that they're learning to have to navigate for the first time uh, is I think a, an excellent pairing of director that has kind of a different vision and the acting uh, performances themselves. So uh, absolutely yeah. agree there. I mean, I kind of also wanted to say Iron Man as well, but anyway, I've gone with... Um... <laughs> I've gone with Harry Potter. Why not? You know, yeah. Um, but there, there is an argument to be made for the first Iron Man, which I think is a really good film. 
very yeah no I, I, to Robert I, I, anyway I, I mean we could go on couldn't we we better, <laughs> right, we better we draw a line there and if you're listening and you think we've missed a really obvious thing that we should have said mm -hmm. and we haven't even mentioned the hunger games or any of those other dystopian spin-offs we ran out of time um let us know but in our fantasy tip jacob which of these films would you send people scurrying off to see if they haven't seen it yet I would, I mean, I've, I've talked a lot about A Monster Calls. I would, I would absolutely recommend that film for, and, and, and especially for this audience, for fantasy uh, creatives uh, and fans, um, that the film itself, uh, the visuals are stunning. You have different, um, Liam Neeson does the voice of, uh, of the monster. Uh, and so Lee, I, I'm a big fan of Lee Neeson's voice. If you liked uh, Aslan's voice in Chronicles of Narnia films, it's the same same voice. Uh, if you like Jedi Masters, it's the same voice. Um, but just like, so the the CGI is, is great. So just like the, the sensibilities are brought there, but then you also have, it's a story about telling stories and the stories we tell ourselves and how stories unexpected, how, how stories uh, aren't might not be what they seem and how they can help pull us through difficult times and so they have within the film there's a few short animated sequences um to the, the premise of you know this the story this monster comes to this child who's struggling with a parent um, who has cancer and he tells him three stories uh and these three stories um powerful in themselves and interesting and, and playing with expectations um but in the film uh, adaptation the they, these are these stories are presented as animated sequences that have these you know beautiful colorful um not too dissimilar from the um uh the deathly hallows animated you know kind of segment yeah. in uh, the, the harry potter um, thing. right mm -hmm. films right yeah so this isn't quite shadow puppetry it's animated but not like a fully you know rendered um uh, it's kind of softer kind of you know um impressionist uh kind of approach to that but storytelling of two different types within the same story about the stories we tell and how they impact us and can help us through uh, the most difficult uh, times that we have in our life. Uh, that, that would be my you know, absolute recommendation. If you haven't seen A Monster Calls um, uh, 2016, um, please go see it. Do yourself a favor and go see that and bring a box of tissues probably <laughs> with yeah. it. Uh, it's not a light popcorn fare. Uh, it's, it's definitely one that that will that will stick with you yeah so I, I might go just to sort of contrast with that i might go um into like sci-fi because we haven't we haven't really spent much time i know people say um 2001 space odyssey is is like the most amazing film i never actually particularly liked that film so i'm not going to recommend it i think you have to watch it if you're a film buff, buff just to let's say you've watched it but actually, I'm, I'm sort of torn between two, um, three. <laughs> so I'm going Star Trek because Star Trek yeah. occasionally produces something really, really interesting. So mm -hmm. Star Trek First Contact um, okay. is one of the Patrick Stewart ones, has some really right. interesting questions in it about artificial intelligence and mm -hmm. the nature of feeling and the nature of being human uh, is well acted. A lot of Patrick Stewart, who I think is a great actor, but a great supporting cast. So that's my favourite of the Star Trek films. Until the reboot, because the other one I was going to say is Star Trek 1 reboot with Chris Pine, is great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just such a good film about how to do interesting science fiction, keeping the focus on relationships and not spectacle. Um, I kind of get a bit lost sometimes in the Star Wars films when they go in for sort of lots of starscapes. I, I prefer the Star Trek relationship emphasis. But it's always got to be, when I come down to it, it's always got to be Galaxy Quest. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, to bring Rick and Rickman back into it. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, got to be. Yeah. Which is, I've said it before, I'll keep on saying it until the whole world has watched Gal Galaxy Quest and laughed. <laughs> Because that is such, it's got Scorny Weaver, it's got Alan Rickman. Oscar nominee. Yeah. <laughs> Alan Rickman. And it's just such also. a fabulous, um, well-constructed, hilarious film. Mm -hmm. And it's the one which I, I won't tire of re-watching. 
and it's it is obviously a fantasy film but it also has fun of fant- it makes fun of fantasy so yeah it's it's self it's certainly self aware yeah so if ever you want to cheer yourself up and think oh i fancy something which is funny but also fantasy that is a good one to go for Uh, right well jacob thank you very much for um talking this through with me and good luck to everybody at the oscars yes thank you thanks for listening to myth makers podcast brought to you by the oxford center for fantasy Visit OxfordCenterForFantasy.org to join in the fun. Find out about our online courses, in-person stays in Oxford, plus visit our shop for great gifts. Tell a friend and subscribe wherever you find your favorite podcasts worldwide.